In this lesson, we'll take a look at how to paint a dog with watercolor. For this lesson, I'll be working on Arches 140 pound cold press watercolor paper, and I'll be using my Cotman Field Watercolor Set by Windsor & Newton. We'll begin by either transferring or lightly sketching the contours of the subject using an HB graphite pencil. Then we can begin applying an application of water. I'll apply the water using a golden edge brush made by Grumbacher. And this is a number 14 brush, so it's a rather large round brush. And while the surface is still wet, we'll start applying color. An application of yellow ochre is applied throughout the face and the neck of the dog in generally the areas of darkest value. With watercolor painting, we need to preserve the lightest areas, allowing the white of the paper to show through to produce the lighter values. So we'll focus most of our efforts in developing the darker tones. Now with a bit of burnt umber and a touch of cobalt blue mixed in with our yellow ochre, we'll make an additional application again in the areas of darkest value. You'll notice at this stage that the painting is still very, very loose. In fact, we're applying wet on wet applications, allowing the colors to bleed into each other. This, of course, will give the final painting that unique look that you can only get with watercolor painting. I think a lot of new artists to watercolor painting try to control the medium too much. And sometimes we just have to relinquish a bit of control, especially in the earlier stages, and allow the water to kind of pull the colors into other locations. The next color we'll introduce is a bit of burnt sienna, and this is a little bit more of a reddish brown. And again, we're concentrating on applying these applications in the locations of darker tone and value. We can, of course, pull them into areas where the value is somewhat more of a middle tone, and even in some of the areas of lighter value. And as each one of these applications is allowed to dry, you'll notice that it dries quite a bit lighter. This gives us the ability to gradually push the full range of value that's necessary to complete the painting. So in other words, there's no rush or we shouldn't feel pressured to develop the darker values as quickly as possible. This is more of a gradual process as we add additional colors and values. The value overall of the painting, the darker tones actually get gradually darker and darker. So now we'll go back with an additional application of our mixture of burnt umber and just a touch of cobalt blue. This will produce more of a natural black, almost a gray color, which will allow us to produce more natural looking darker tones in the painting. And of course, these darker tones are applied around the eyes and at the end of the nose and just underneath the nose as well and in the areas of shadow underneath the neck and around the ears. Now we'll go back with a stronger application of our yellow ochre and add just a bit more color. And you'll notice that as this color is applied, some of the darker tones that we've established underneath show through since, of course, each application that we make with a watercolor paint is semi-translucent. We'll pull some of this lighter yellow ochre across the top of the crown of the head too to give that area a little bit of color as well. We'll also allow our strokes to be a bit broken in areas so we'll allow bits of the white paper to show through. Now of course you may run into some issues where you put too much pigment on the surface and if that happens it's very easy to lift the watercolor from the surface especially if you recognize that you've potentially put too much pigment uh, right when it happens. To lift the color, all you need to do is apply a little bit of water using your brush and then gently dab with a paper towel. And of course, you'll lift up the pigment from the surface when you dab up the water. We'll add a light application of color to the tongue at this point using a mixture of cadmium red, pale hue, and a touch of alizarin crimson. And we'll also add that color just on the tip of the nose as well, just to add a little bit more unity and continuity to the piece. Now we've allowed our initial applications to dry completely and we're going back with a heavier application in the darkest parts of the eye. Now this is a mixture of burnt umber and a touch of cobalt blue. Of course this mixture is dominated by the burnt umber to give it more of a warmer feel. We've also switched over to a smaller brush. This is a number four golden edge brush by Grumbacher. And this brush, of course, gives us a little bit more control and it'll allow us to get a little bit more refined with our details. You'll also notice that this mixture or the, the consistency of the paint is a little bit heavier on the pigmentation side. So there's a little bit less water in the mix. We're still allowing the color to bleed a bit to make sure that we have that watercolor feel in the painting when we're complete. 
Now, even with these applications that have a heavier pigmentation associated with them, they still dry to a lighter value. So we'll need to revisit these sections with an additional application, making the value slightly darker. And with the smaller brush in hand, we'll revisit some of the darker values and shadows that happen around the ears. Of course, this smaller brush gives us a bit more control so that we can be a little bit more precise with the shapes that we make here. With a bit of water loaded on the brush, we can pull some of these applications over to the side of the face of the dog, easing the transition of value from dark to light. To ease this transition even further, we'll add a bit of burnt sienna and allow that to bleed into our darker shadow that we created just underneath the left ear. We'll continue applying a bit of the burnt sienna to other portions of the dog as well. With each additional color that we apply to the painting, the depth of the color is enhanced. This, of course, is because of the translucency of the watercolor. It allows some of the colors that we have applied underneath to show through. We'll continue applying the burnt sienna to various locations around the head, neck, and body of the dog. Now we can get a little bit more bold with our applications. Again, here with the burnt sienna, there's just a touch of yellow ochre mixed in as well. And initially, this color may seem very strong, but you'll see that as it dries, it also becomes a bit lighter. Now, with these stronger applications, we can begin to insinuate some of the details of the fur of the dog. Now, we're not going to spell everything out for our viewer. In other words, we're not going to paint every single strand of fur. Instead, we're going to imply the texture of the fur through the relationship of values. So we'll leave some lighter tones in between our darker applications to create the impression of the direction that the fur grows. And of course, as we get darker with our applications, we'll increase the contrast in these locations and make the impression of the texture a bit stronger. At this point, though, we'll revisit the eyes and put another application of our dark value that we created by mixing burnt umber and cobalt blue. Again, this mixture is dominated by the burnt umber. We'll also, of course, darken the values on the nose and just underneath the nose as well. Of course, we want to create a focal point in this scene, and the focal point naturally is going to be the eyes of the dog. We're naturally drawn to the eyes of anything that has eyes on it. So this is natural, but we can increase the focal point by increasing the contrast in these areas. So we'll make the darks a little bit darker in these locations. And of course, this is the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. We want the focus to be on the face of the dog, but naturally we're going to gravitate to the eyes anyway. We'll also begin darkening up some of the tones even further on the ears and the fur around the face. And again, since we're still working with the smaller brush, we have the ability to imply some of the texture here. So we'll be pulling the brush strokes out in the direction that the fur grows. Of course, leaving areas for the lighter tones and values and applying the paint in the locations where the value is a bit darker. As you can see, this is a gradual process, building up the tones and values and uh, developing the colors in a watercolor painting like this. Of course, we could get a little bit bolder with our applications a little bit quicker, but I've found that this patient approach gives us a lot more control and uh, really allows us to develop the details in a painting, even though it may start very loose. Now, up to this point, I haven't really discussed much about the brushes that I'm using for this painting. I'm using my favorite brushes for watercolor painting, which are the Golden Edge brushes, which are made by Grumbacher. These golden edge brushes are synthetic brushes, meaning that the fibers are made of nylon. The reason why I like these brushes is they have a good ample amount of spring associated with them, so they stay very stiff, giving me a lot of control to apply the watercolor paint. They're rigid enough to hold their shape, but they're soft enough that we can apply watercolor easily. Now, I know that there are many out there that will argue that you don't have to have higher quality materials to be successful at creating art. And to a certain extent, I agree with that. But I also have noticed that when you do use higher quality tools and materials, you're more likely to get higher quality results. So I would suggest that if you are interested in doing watercolor painting, then invest in a few higher quality brushes like I'm using here. Also make sure that your surface is strong enough to support multiple applications of water. 
I'm using 140 pound watercolor paper for this demonstration. It's cold press watercolor paper. And this is absolutely the lowest level that I would go to to create a watercolor painting. There's still some buckling that are, that's happening with these multiple applications. I wouldn't suggest going to a watercolor paper that's weaker or thinner than 140 pounds. And if you're not sure what that number designation means, basically the 140 pounds means that a ream of this paper, that's 500 sheets of paper, weighs 140 pounds. This number, of course, refers to the thickness of a paper. So a paper that has a higher number, that means that paper is a lot thicker. And if the number is a little bit lower, that means that paper is a little bit thinner. And typically, higher numbered watercolor papers or papers that are heavier are going to perform better. There's going to be less buckling and wrinkling. And of course, when you have buckling and wrinkling that happens on the surface, you get colors that pull and you have all kinds of things that happen with your painting that you don't necessarily want to happen. So use higher quality materials and use higher quality tools and you will see the difference in your finished work. Okay, at this point, we've just continued to apply various applications of colors. These are mostly applications made with burnt sienna, perhaps a little bit of the yellow ochre mixed in, and a touch of burnt umber in areas to make the value a little bit darker. And you can see here that these colors over the top of the darker tones that we've established earlier are really making some areas a bit richer and a bit more realistic and representational. And of course, we'll consider the directional strokes that are made here as we continue to apply the color. And we're trying to make these brush strokes flow in the direction that the fur grows on the face and head and neck of the dog. But here again, we're not getting too carried away with all of the details. We're just insinuating the details and giving the impression of the texture. Of course, you're free to take this a bit further if you want, and if you do want to, to paint each one of those individual strands of fur, you're more than welcome to do that. After a few more applications to the side of the face and just underneath the eye with the, the smaller to medium sized brush, we'll switch back over to our larger brush and make some bold applications of color. This is a mixture of burnt sienna and yellow ochre and a touch of burnt umber. And of course, in some areas, we're going to allow the burnt sienna to dominate, and in others, we'll allow the yellow ochre to dominate. And in the areas where we want to make the value a bit darker, we'll allow some more of the burnt umber in the mixture. These bolder applications, of course, increase the saturation of color in the painting, but do so in a way that allows some of the textural strokes and the values underneath to show through. Now we'll switch over to a much smaller brush. Now this is a double zero round brush, again from the Golden Edge line of brushes. And we're going to go back with some darker applications. Again, a mixture of burnt umber and a bit of cobalt blue in the areas around the eyes. And of course, we're gonna keep that area of highlight preserved. So of course, this is just the white of the paper showing through. And we'll simply darken up some of the values, increase the contrast, and of course, refine some of the details here. And of course, we'll do the same thing on the nose as well. And by increasing the contrast and value, we're enhancing these locations as being a focal point. We'll add a few brush strokes to indicate some texture on the tip of the nose. And then just underneath the nose, of course, we'll add a few directional strokes to indicate a bit of fur. Again, using our darker mixture of burnt umber and a touch of cobalt blue. We'll darken up some of the shadowed areas in and around the mouth as well. Again, increasing the contrast. And to make the color a little bit stronger on the tongue, right now it's a bit too faint, we'll add an additional application of our mixture of cadmium red pale hue and alizarin crimson. And this time, just a touch of yellow ochre is added to the mix as well. And once it's applied, we'll gently dab the surface with the paper towel, which will produce a more realistic texture. Now, of course, we'll need to add some whiskers, and to do this, we'll use a scratching tool. And we're just going to gently scratch the surface of the paper, which will remove some of the pigment without destroying the paper too much to give the impression of a few whiskers. For this, I'm using a scratch board etching tool, and I'm just basically pulling the tool over the surface to remove the watercolor. You can use any sharp tool that you wish, including an X-Acto blade or a craft knife. 
And now with the kneaded eraser, we'll gently lift and erase some of the visible graphite lines. Of course, it's okay to leave some of these lines visible. And now our watercolor painting of a dog is complete. If you enjoyed this video, then subscribe to the channel. And if you're ready to learn even more about drawing and painting, then check out our comprehensive membership program, which includes video courses, weekly live lessons, eBooks, lesson plans for teachers, and much, much more. Just click on the link to learn more. Thank you so much for watching.